Blog Talk Radio. Greetings and salutations, Hempsters. This is your Hemptrepreneurial host, Tyler Hemp. Welcome aboard the Hemp Ship of Hempaware Radio. And um, this is the place where we focus on what's most important to you and solve your problems, solve your issues with cannabis hemp, and ultimately the world's largest problems with focusing on hemp. It's February 7th, 2017, as we're broadcasting this show, and you may be listening to a recorded version of the show, and if you are, thank you so much for your attention, thank you for your time. Your time is certainly one of the most valuable resources, and I sincerely appreciate you investing it and raising your awareness about the super critical benefits of hemp. And this show is committed to creating a paradigm shift in consciousness around the world. We're here to inspire, educate, motivate, uplift, and help you utilize industrial hemp for your clothing, your food, your energy applications, healing, and building a healthy home environment and ultimately economy. Popular Mechanics Magazine wrote back in February of 1938, And they published an article that said there are over 25,000 products that can be made from hemp. Just imagine if our basic needs are met, just our food, our, our homes are built with hemp and our clothing is made from hemp. Imagine the amazing things that we can do with this life. Picture utilizing a resource that is so easy to grow, easy to process, easy to harvest compared to, you know, what it takes to harvest trees and oil uh, for our energy and, and home applications. So on this episode, I'm very excited to have our special guest. He's a colleague of mine and a longtime close friend, Mr. Charles Holmes with Planet Hemp. Uh, but before we jump onto the show, um, I just want to remind you to, uh, you, you can listen to any past episodes, including uh, today's show on iTunes podcast library. And you can search just uh, the word hemp aware, all one word, or you can tune in at hempaware.com forward slash radio. Also, uh, if you have any problems that you're dealing with in the hemp industry in particular, and you're looking for a topic or a solution that we want to, um, to provide you or that you want us to provide for you on hempaware radio, you can just send us an email at support at hempaware.com. Let us know what topics you want to hear about. And so once again, I think it's the third time that uh, we're being blessed with Charles's presence, and what an honor it is, again, to have an open conversation with Charles about all the parts of the hemp plant and their uses and benefits. And the reason you want to listen very closely to this show is because this information is coming from someone who has been working very closely in the Canadian hemp fields the factories and uh, in different businesses uh, for almost two decades. He's a a true hemp entrepreneur and Charles is a brilliant man when it comes to understanding the value and quality of soil uh, that we grow our hemp in, the, the water, the quality of water and other crucial components to succeeding in the hemp world. And he's has an amazing team behind him um, that have brought several hemp companies to the market and they've done very well with them, including Living Harvest, Hempco Canada, Conscious Planet, and now Planet Hemp. Uh, right now, I want to impress upon you the importance of having a mentor or a coach in your life. Having a mentor or a coach is almost like finding a passcode to a higher level in the game of life. And I consider Charles a valuable mentor of mine, and I'm so thankful to discuss with him this topic of the whole hemp plant. So thank you so much for being on the show again, Charles. Welcome aboard. You're very kind, Tyler. Thank you. And I'm honored to be on the show again. Thank you. Yeah. So before we get started on all the different parts of the hemp plant, and for those who may not have uh, heard your history, can you give us a brief introduction to your relationship with hemp? Thank you. Yeah, it all started for me as a vegetarian. I became uh, protein deficient about 20 years ago, and I was looking for the ultimate vegan protein source for humans, and I started looking hard. And I had some resources mm-hmm. and a lot of uh, so you, you know, high intentions. So you come across demand. hemp, and you realize this is it. This is, this is uh, 
This is the key to uh, my protein yep. needs. Yep, I just wow. it at the Food Development Center in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Very interesting. And so, so your whole family is, is very much involved in the hemp industry, and um, it's, it's really exciting. You know, we've been working together definitely over 10 years. It might even be 12, 13, something like that. So um, I know you've been in this for a really long time, and you uh, have been able to get your – yourself into different aspects of the hemp plant and really focus on the quality and integrity of the hemp that you're producing and really get fully integrated with the whole production and processing and ha- growing, harvesting with directly. So before we get into, you know, the whole plant itself, I'd love to talk about the topic of soil, which is possibly the most important topic because, uh, the you know, depending on the soil, it's really going to determine the quality and, and, and the integrity of the plant itself. Um, let, let's talk about, you know, ideal properties of soil uh, for hemp, uh, especially in, in Canada and, you know, different parts of the world if we want. Um, tell us about your, your perspective on the importance of soil and, and some of the aspects of, you know, how, how to um, have healthy soil when growing hemp. I agree wholeheartedly, Tyler. You know, if we don't have soil, everything else breaks down, breaks down our whole chain of life because we are what we eat. And as humans, you know, we need to, to eat essential nutrients and we get them from good plants and good food that's grown out in our fields and trees and bushes. And if that soil is depleted, which it is, we've had, you know, decades of soil that has less than 10% of the nutrients it had 100 years ago. That obviously mm-hmm. is... A, a, a huge attribute to what we see is disease epidemics, all especially in North America. And we're forcing mm-hmm. soil to do what it's not used to do, growing monocrops and having chemical fertilizers and chemical treatments all over it and all sorts of other toxins that have been implemented in our food chain. And, of course, it's killing bacteria, which is the key elements in the soil that must break down rocks into organic material. Mm-hmm. And so what we discovered, especially even with working with hemp plants, is they're, they're big takers of stuff out of the soil if we don't put stuff back in properly. So what ha- what's happened in the last 50 years with chemicalization of our food chain is the, the notion that we should be feeding plants. Well, like you just said, soil is a critical factor, so we must learn to feed soil. So if we're not putting fulvic and humic acids and other minerals and concentrates back into the soil that's chelated to, for, so the plants can get access and microorganisms – different kinds of bacteria, probiotics, different kinds of enzymes. We don't have a living matter anymore. We just have dead soil that now, it, it, if we add chemical fertilizers, it, maybe, it could grow a plant, looks like a tomato, but there's nothing in it. And we're, we're getting, you know, not, we're not getting the essential nutrients we need to get from those plants. And that's a critical factor. So what are some of the things that you've been able to implement to inoculate the soil with, these healthy bacteria or nutrients, like what, what do you do specifically to provide the soil these nutrients? Yeah, we're not alone, Tyler. There's lots of people, especially in North America, realize this is a key problem. And there's, there's huge movements of, of awareness and specific applications to rebuild soil. And those key elements, like I mentioned, were fulvic and humic acid, which fulvic acid is one of the key elements in life. As a, it's, it's nature's most complex molecule. It's everywhere. But when it's depleted, we don't have the chelation effect we're used to of rocks being broken down by bugs and enzymes and this fulvic acid act- activation with the plants to, to be turned into organic matter. We, we're, de- we're not designed to eat rocks. So our farmers mm-hmm. now, especially in our hemp industry, they've realized that these are big plants and they use a lot. So they, they make sure when they put these nutrients back into the soil, they're in a form that the plants can use them. So when we're using mm-hmm. synthetic nutrients the plants don't get the same access. Just like when we go down to the health food store and you pull a bottle of calcium off the shelf and you read the back and it says ground up oyster shells. Well, good luck. Right. We're, not, yeah. we're not designed to eat oyster shells. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean you put something in your mouth, it's going to be a nutrient. It means the critical factor is utilization of those nutrients. So we've got to get access. Mm-hmm. Just because you eat it doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's food. Yeah. So it's yeah, the there's... same with soil. Just because you throw it on them doesn't mean it's good for it. Right. Yeah, that's crucial. There, there, what I've learned over the years is there's four main elements to a powerful nutritional uh, protocol or, or I guess the, the process of nutrition or absorbing 
and, and it's ingestion. You know, we have to look at the quality of what we're ingesting and then it's digesting. Are we completely breaking that down, you know, through enzyme processes and mineralization, especially magnesium is super critical for over 300 enzyme reactions in the body. And then the third step is assimilation. Is it getting put where it needs to be put in the body? And then finally elimination. Are we getting rid of the, the excess waste byproducts? So I, um, I completely agree with you. And I think it's, you know, critical that all the farmers around the world, not just hemp farmers are taking a look at the quality of what they're putting in the soil. And um, w- would you say things like um, sea vegetables or seaweed, uh, uh, shilajit, and you know different m- mineral pitches and things like that. Is is that what um, farmers need to be looking at, or are there specific um, the, the, probiotics? Yeah, no, good point. They can. A lot of different soils can use things from the sea, but it's not that it's not that prevalent, especially in the prairies. These guys don't have easy access to those kind of things. And mm-hmm. so they do work, look towards more like the fulvic and humics, from, which is basically a shilajit kind of a rock material that they have compressed plant matter that's been there for thousands of years, right? So right. They, they get a hell of this stuff and mix it into what they call a tea with water and other things, and then they spread it onto the soils, and it starts activating the bacteria and the, and the nematodes and all these kind of things really quickly. And all they start doing their work of, to chomp up on all the organic material, and they start making a living organism again in the soil. So when you plant seeds, they immediately start doing what they need to do. And mm-hmm. the soil doesn't produce weeds, which is a big – Yes. So, in fact, I just was talking with a farmer two days ago, and he showed me the difference between doing tillage with radishes on a field. And, and the next field right beside it, he did tillage with peas. Now, one, radishes are the highest alkaline source of food for humans. Well, when you put it into the soil, it does the same thing. It alkalizes and balances the soil with magnesium and things like this and calcium. Well, hmm. he, the soil looked perfect and was not one weed in the whole field. Right beside wow. it, all alongside it, you can see in the picture, he took a picture of both fields at the same time. And the one on the right was pea silage, t- uh, uh, tillage, was um, more acidic. More, even though it was putting in more protein and things like that and nitrogen into the soil, it created way more weeds and thick green weeds like chamomile and stuff that's really hard to get out. So the soil was also very upset trying to get this green stuff back into it by making these weeds, just like we need herbs to balance off our body when we get out of balance. So was the soil. Mm -hmm. How interesting. So so when it comes to the hemp plant and its symbiotic relationship with the soil, do you feel that, you know, you talked about monocropping or, you know, harvesting on the same soil over and over. Is there an ideal ratio of like, you know, maybe taking a break from using hemp and switching out to something like radishes or, or oats or, you know, something other than hemp, or is it okay to keep growing hemp on the same soil? It's, it's rare they can grow a big plant like that year after year. They have to do uh, what they call rotation of crops. So they're always mm-hmm. moving things around to help that soil get what it needs and not give up so much into one area. Okay. So it, it's important to, plant other crops kind of on a rotational cycle and mm-hmm. help re-nourish mm-hmm. the soil, kind of re- re-inoculate it with these minerals and give it a rest and then come back to it. Yeah, so these guys, they were showing me evidence of how important radishes were. Now, radishes, mm-hmm. you typically see radishes in the store about the size of a golf ball, right? Mm-hmm. I saw radishes in this field that were the size of footballs. Oh, my gosh. So when they, when they tilled this, wow. these big leafy plants, when they tilled them back into the soil, well, actually they didn't. They, leave, they left it the whole winter. So because it had big two-foot leafy, big leafy uh, stems coming out of the ground on top of these big roots masses of these big footballs of radishes, they, they attracted wow. the snow. And so when the, when the spring came, the snow got held around all the plants and it, they rotted them all down and, and there was lots of moisture. And the bugs just went crazy. Wow. And, the plant, and the soil was perfect, balanced pH. Oh. And not one um, weed, weed needed to grow. He just went out there and just planted his seeds right into it. Didn't have to till. He, you know, he's an organic grower. He didn't have to till. He didn't, have to, he didn't even have to think about spraying anything to kill weeds because the soil took right. care of itself because he took care of the soil. Amazing. So as far as the yeah. pH of the soil, was it like maybe like a seven and a half, eight pH? Or? I don't think it was that much. It probably went pH neutral. So probably hit around seven, okay. you know, six, and okay. six to 7.1 maybe. Okay, very nice. 
So let's get into the next uh, topic, which is the, the part of the plant that's closest to the soil, which is literally in the soil, and that's the hemp roots. So what are right. the roots mainly, as far as you know, their, their composition, what are they mainly made up of? I know it's probably a lot of cellulose. Yeah, to be honest, I have not done a lot of work in this area because typically the farmers are just mulching it back into the soil and letting the soil grind it up and use it again for the next nutrients, right? Mm-hmm. But I have been told that they are rich in a lot of phytonutrients, a lot of micronutrients, and even amino acids. So mm-hmm. they, they produce a lot. And then there is people talking about making medicines from that as well. I've not participated yeah. in that. But, yes, it's, it's yeah. being, being the type of plant it is, because it does grow deep roots, it'll, it'll draw from everywhere. So it's going to be rich throughout the plant. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I've heard mm-hmm. that hemp roots have been used throughout history for, like, salves and topical pain relieving um, applications and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. sure yeah, me too. in the future, we're going to see a lot of uh, hemp, hemp root teas and hemp root powders and hemp root, uh, you know, lotions or salves and things of, uh, like that. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, me too. So the roots obviously grow into becoming hemp stalks and the stalks, are mainly composed of, of cellulose. I think they're, what, 70% cellulose? Is that right? And it's also the longest, most durable fiber on planet Earth. So there's nothing right. you can't make out of, of hemp fiber. And there's, So there's basically two components. It's the fiber on the outside and it's the herd or the shiv on the inside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the shiv is, is used for hemp uh, herd or, or uh, building applications, composites, and hemp crete and and can be uh, broken down into a powder for like uh, hemp printing. What do they do? These uh, ink uh, deep three D printing devices and things like that. Is that is that what they exactly. use for three uh, D printing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the long the long fiber that, like you said, the bast fiber, the outer fiber. That's what we see used in paper and textiles, ropes, twines. And uh, any any long fiber applications um, can be you yeah. Know, there's a there's a new factory up here in Edmonton, Alberta that makes that, that makes matting out of it. So they keep pressing it into like a felt type material, and they mm. press it into forms for car panels and headliners for insulation panels. For so it's a big contract with this company they just got with General Motors. So they're making you know, door panels and things out of it. So you're driving around okay. in your 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 Buick enclave your all your panels and your ceiling <laughs> things are made out of hemp how cool and, you know, so, mercedes and bmw yeah. and audi they've been doing it for years i've heard that yeah something like almost 30 percent of the vehicles in europe have hemp fiber composites in them that was yeah. by uh statistic i think i learned from the hemp industry association quite a while ago and they've been doing it for so yeah. long i mean as most of our listeners know yeah. hemp has been utilized for some say in upwards of 10,000 years that the, the uh, Orient, you know, back in Asia, they, they were making, ga- you know, gowns and robes and paper and ropes and things like that thousands of years ago. So this is such an ingrained part of our history or literally been woven in the, into the fabric of human history. So it's, it's so exciting to be alive right now and be a part of the resurrection of in- industrial hemp and cannabis. It's, it's truly a blessing and a miracle, and you're just doing so many amazing things. Are you guys um, planning on integrating more fiber applications with what you're doing? I know Planet Hemp is mainly focused on hemp foods, which we're going to get into here shortly. Yes, HempGo has made a commitment, and we purchased the cortication equipment in the last few months, and we're just setting it up. So our plan is oh, to be wow. operational by the spring, yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. I'm so glad to yeah, hear our that. Man- our mandate is whole crop utilization, so we're – you know, supporting our farmers to now buy the stocks from them. They roll it up into big bales and they bring it to us and we're going to break it down and separate it into this fiber from the herd and start selling yeah. it out. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very good. I mean, it's time, you know, it's, how, it's, it's been, I think over 20 years that ca- Canada has been growing uh, industrial hemp. Is that right? Since like 1998 started. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 1998. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, um, been long in coming you know it took 19 years to to finally get up and running on the whole fiber i know canada's 
possibly the leading seed producer in the world next to England or Germany or these other European countries. Um, Romania is not really doing a lot of seed. They're doing more fiber applications. Um, right. Ukraine so China. Has, yeah. Oh, right. Absolutely. China is probably number one for fiber. So mm-hmm. the stocks give birth to the hemp leaves and these beautiful, rich, green hemp leaves create this canopy over the, over the field and help uh, nourish the soil when they fall. I think it probably obviously gives some nourishment when the leaves fall to the soil. What are the leaves mainly composed of? Obviously chlorophyll is the first guess that I would say in silica. Yeah. And they're really rich in minerals. Mm-hmm. If you've ever eaten one, they're really bitter. So when you have that bitter mm-hmm. kind of a taste and flavor, it's because it's rich in minerals. Totally. Of, I... uh, phytonutrients like terpenes and such mm-hmm. and we're also realizing in the last few years as well it's really rich in cannabinoids or cannabidiol mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that's um I, i've had the luxury of of having a a salad with hemp sprouts leaves hemp seeds drizzled with some hemp seed oil lemon <laughs> and uh and maybe some salt and, you know, some other spices, maybe cayenne. And I, I swear, I, I, when I was eating this salad, I was so giddy. Like my, a, a, my friend Jared and I, we, we made this salad with the hemp leaves and the, and the sprouts and the, the seeds and the oil. And we were just laughing. I, and we weren't high. You know, we were like totally sober. We were just laughing so hard because of how amazing this salad was. We were just, you know, the fact that we had hemp sprouts, hemp leaves, hemp seeds, hemp seed oil, it was just so exciting to us. Um, <laughs> nice. And uh, so, yeah, I, obviously, you know, some of the uses of, of hemp leaf would be, you know, directly putting it in a salad. We could put it in our smoothies. Um, I've even heard of people powderizing the hemp leaf and, being able to put it, you know, in other tea applications or just putting that powder right in a smoothie or on a salad. Um, It's, it's, I've heard that it's very high in magnesium, which is an amazing health nutrient that I kind of mentioned before. Have you had, have you ever had iron uh, and and manganese? It's a great blood builder. Right. Yeah. Anything, anything uh, that's green, rich, rich in magnesium and iron is definitely a good blood builder. And apparently uh, plant blood, which is um, at the center of plant blood, is magnesium. And at the center of our blood is iron. So it's the only, right. only difference is, you know, iron to magnesium. So it's, it's a very close to our blood. You know, anything that's green. Yeah, the, only thing, yeah, the, only, thing, the only thing that's seen from chlorophyll is, is iron. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, everything is the same as our blood. Wow. So there you have it, folks. Eat some, eat some hemp leaves as soon as possible. Hopefully um, <laughs> regulations will change, and, and that will be one of your mandates to start providing hemp leaf powder. I look yeah, forward to that. that would be nice. It's going to still be part of the legalization process because, we're, because it has CBDs in it um, and the chance yeah. of THC. We're not allowed to touch it yet in Canada. I know. That's truly absurd and i think there's some some major traction right now in the u.s with this whole dea um lawsuit that's that's happening with uh, the hia apparently they're yep. um, jumping on board and vote hemp they're you know the whole legal team is is um suing the dea for for basically trying to say that cannabinoids so yep, I'm looking exactly. forward Both to times. supporting. It is. So once leaves have have matured and uh, they become, you know, sort of the spawning of the hemp blossoms or or the hemp flowers. Yep. Um, obviously, most people know cannabinoids. Caffeines are very rich in the flowers. Um, I know years years ago, we say hemp is the male. And, and cannabis or quote marijuana is the, the female. But over the years, we've, we've come to realize it's not actually the truth because we have full and female industrial hemp. So, Correct. What, what, yeah. what is the 
major difference between hemp and marijuana? The biggest difference I can express is they're from the same family of plants, but ones that are stressed, female plants that are stressed, so for instance, if there's no males present, they start to create more resin to try to attract males to procreate, or if they've been, they're in, in high heat or they're in, they're in a situation of uh, different kinds of light, like, like lighting systems that are uh, in a building, those don't give a full spectrum and they cause a stress on them or they're chemicalized in any way. So all these things stress these plants and they start creating more THC. And THC, yes, is one of the cannabinoids that we receive benefits from. We can. But in concentrated sources and having it heated, it does not get destroyed where at, 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 at higher temperatures, like say 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, at 250 Fahrenheit, all the other CBDs that are alongside it start to get destroyed. And, it's constant, and those, some of those other CBDs inhibit that psychoactive effect when you smoke pot. So if you're smoking pot, that's why you're getting this toxic effect of psychoactive effect and possibly damage to the brain because of, of what it does. So this is what everybody's concerned about. But when you're eating hemp or you're consuming it by juicing and different things that aren't or, or vaporizers and things like that, and you're not typically heating it past 250 degrees and smoking it like that, you can get way more benefits health-wise than you would from concentrated THC. It's not what we want ultimately. Right. And, and the, the non-psychoactive, non-psychoactive variety of THC is, is known as THCA, which is THC acid. Exactly. And exactly. when it's on the plant, as you said, it's, it's, it's non-psychoactive. It's, it's when it goes to that decarboxylation and that acid is taken off. And like you said, it's, it's converted into that psychoactive form. So even if cannabis, psychoactive cannabis that is high in THC is being grown in the field, you can go out, harvest it, like you said, take those leaves, take those buds or flowers and juice them and drink them, and you're not going to get high, but you are going to receive tremendous benefit. You know, all these um, articles and clinical studies and, you know, doctors that are coming out now showing how it's, it's helping with epilepsy and cancer and arthritis and diabetes and pain relief. Uh, there's an amazing website now called thecanopedia.org, and they've been putting out mm-hmm. tremendous amount of research and just kind of you know, being the Wikipedia of cannabis and showing, you know, that, look, this is legitimate. It's, it's not the devil's weed. It's, it's not what people used to think that it, that it is. It's truly a gift from God. And even in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, 2, it said, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. So we have to take heed to that truth and realize that this is a gift from God. It's not a, not a, you know, a sin from the devil. It's, it's truly a, a miraculous <laughs> plant and it's, it's, it's made for the service of man. And so herb is for the service of man is another quote from the Bible. So it's up to us to, to let it serve us and to not denature it or to destroy it or, you know, mutate it in any way. And I think you brought up a great point that it, it's psychoactive cannabis is, pretty much a man-made thing. I mean, it's, it's a man-made concept um, in terms of, you know, um, keeping it away from the pollination, keeping it um, in a certain life cycle or breeding it, you know, selectively breeding it so that it's higher in THC. And <clears throat> it's, um, it's kind of a man-made thing. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the varieties of cannabis that are, that are high in THC that produce, you know, um, very high quality hemp, industrial hemp, uh, because Paul Stanford, one of the leading cannabis activists, uh, who I think is based in Oregon or Washington, he um, proclaims that the higher the THC level, the, the more voluptuous the seeds that we can actually produce. So he's all about, you know, setting standards of higher THC levels in industrial hemp so that we can have higher yields. Is that something that you've heard about before? I've not, no, but it's possible. Again, and depending on how we utilize it, you know, if we're focused on or getting high, we're focused on a treatment process, just like we've been kind of brainwashed the last 
50 or 60 years with the, how the medical system has kind of taken over into this disease treatment system instead of a health and preventive maintenance system. With that kind of thinking, you know, that's what's attracted where we're at with this. And until mm-hmm. we look at ourselves as a whole and all everyone else around us as a whole living organism and how we work together and uh, do, you know, try to focus on having our health first, then all those other cravings for sweets and drugs, they start to go away when you have your health. And you, have, mm-hmm. you, know, when you, were, you mentioned the four aspects of uh, um, ingestion yes. and mm-hmm. you know, utilization and digestion. I'm going to add one more to that. Number mm-hmm. five is illumination. Mm. You know, it's about raising consciousness. It's about integrating consciousness and knowing, knowing who we are and how we're reacting with our friends and family and, and community around us. We're not taking that into consideration, and we're, we're doing harm to others and ourselves, especially by doing things like this. We're missing the point. Wow. And we're, we are now in a chain reaction of you know, what, what people would call this, this would even use the term evil weed or sinful pro- sinful a- action we're we're participating in, and it doesn't have to be like that at all. It's all about our intentions. It is. It is. And as you mentioned, illumination that that is our goal. You know, vitality and radiance. It we literally are spiritual, electrical, unlimited beings. We're spiritual beings first, having a human experience, and the foods that we consume. Based on a lot of my research, my own personal experience with juicing and fasting and, you know, supplementation and living foods, cultured foods, what I've learned over the years uh, is that enzymes are the spark of life. Enzymes are literally electricity. Uh, it's, a, it's a protein molecule or, you know, amino acids with electricity running through them. So if we're consuming living foods and living juices and you know, plant matter, they're, they're electrical beings that we're putting into our bodies to recharge our body. And so you're absolutely right that, you know, if we're not, if we're first of all, ingesting high quality foods that are alive, that are, that are electrical and have an electrical potential or an enzyme potential, and we're able to break it down completely, assimilate it, and then eliminate the waste byproducts you're absolutely right that the result is illumination. I, I love that. I'm going to definitely add that to my, to my, uh, <laughs> my teachings. So, and so it is. We, yes. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to ask you, you know, we, we've, co- we've covered the roots, we've covered the soil, the stalks, the leaves. Um, the final step would be the seeds. <clears throat> and yeah. before we get into the seeds, that's probably the, the topic that you know most about and have studied and experienced the most. Um, but I, I had a question that came up in my mind, which is depending on what you're growing hemp for, you know, there's some people that are growing it for seed. There's some people that are growing it for the stock, the long fiber for textiles or ropes. Some people are growing it for multiple um, uses, which that's your goal is to try to use every aspect of the plant. Is there specific protocols for growing the hemp and planting the hemp and treating the soil, depending on what you're growing it for? Um, You know, in Canada, most of the crops that we grow here are based on seed production. So all the varieties are all basically um, picked towards that. There's a very small amount of stuff being grown for fiber. And, you know, again, there is lots of stuff being out, grown out there for psychoactive effects, but it's not part of our studies. But it's a lot of it's underground growing now. It's coming out a bit now with licenses and stuff for making medicinals. But, yeah, we, we basically are focusing on doing that soil based on what that plant's taken out. Mm-hmm. This, okay. Yeah. And then w- one other uh, thing I think that would be a, a differentiator on on what you're growing for. I I know that if you're growing for long fiber, like in China, they they plant very close together, like literally an inch, two inches apart, three inches apart. Whereas if you're growing for seed, you kind of want a little more space between the stalks so that they can mature and develop a little bit more. Is that correct? Um, I don't know if that's something I would say is is kind of a consistent because the stalks okay. get really big from plants that are being grown for fiber. Mm-hmm. So like for instance, I've seen c- crops grown in Australia and we sell them in the south parts of China. They, they'll grow 
you know, 15 to 20 feet tall in four, four right. or five months. And right. the stalks are the biggest trees. They're, they're two, three, four inches across. So mm-hmm. you couldn't plant them close. You have to plant them actually farther apart, you know, a foot apart probably to get the best results or more. Oh. Yeah. So with seed, okay. well, we try to separate them a little bit. At least uh, a lot of guys are finding that you know, when they put in 25 to 30 pounds of hemp seed per acre, they get a pretty decent result. But I just talked to a guy who planted five pounds of the acre, and he specifically planted his seeds uh, like a foot apart in each direction, and he had just the same results or better. Interesting. <laughs> because he okay. took care of each one of those plants, and they grew differently. They grew bigger and bolder and had mm-hmm. more leaves, and they took in more nutrients, and they, they just acted differently. So more is not always That's better. Amazing. Yeah, and over time we're going to find – you know, different things work for different people. You might get the same yieldage, but you're growing in different methods. And so one trick works for all. It's it's kind of a, going to yep. be a hodgepodge of different applications or, or methods, I should say. <laughs> yep. Tyler, if you can hear me, I can't hear you. Tyler? Tyler? Hello? Hello? 